Hey guys, Thomas Busby here with another astronomical video. Today we're looking at the best settings for Milky Way photography using the Fujifilm system. Now I don't want to mislead anyone, there are a few things this video will not cover. It is not covering the GFX system, that video is coming in the future, I'm waiting for the new moon and those lenses to arrive. It is not covering deep space photography and it's not covering if you're using a tracker, though this will still apply a little bit if you want to use a stacker. Now speaking of which, this is a little bit complex of a video. If you are new to astronomical photography, I'd recommend checking out my previous astro video up here with some real basic cheat sheets to that. But, like I said, this video isn't going to be that easy to follow. It is going to be a little bit advanced. So even if you are very, very experienced in astrophotography, I'd recommend heading over to my Instagram page or my website and downloading, screenshotting, sharing, whatever you need to do of my advanced cheat sheets. These have got some <laughs> complicated information, which I'm going to explain in this video of how to get the perfect astronomical shots for the perfect settings every single time when using Fujifilm cameras. Okay, first of all, shutter speed. To work out the perfect setting in this area, to work out the perfect shutter speed, there are a few factors you need to consider. Number one, how wide is your shot and what lens are you using, what have you got it set to? Number two, the size of your sensor and how many megapixels it is. So for all of this video, we're going to be basing it off the latest 26.1 megapixel APS-C sensor from Fujifilm. If you're using a slightly older 24 megapixel sensor, this maths will still be really, really close. However, if you're using the older 16 megapixel sensor, then some of this is going to be a little bit out, but still heaps of this information is going to be very, very helpful. Number three is which direction you are pointing your camera. So this won't be news to most of you, but the Earth is spinning. And if you look at the, like, right towards the astral equator, that is where the stars are seem to be moving the most. And if you turn 90 degrees away from that, towards one of the astral poles, whether the northern or the southern one, depending on which part of the planet you live on, that point will be moving the least. So which direction you are facing will affect your shutter speed required, depending on how much the Earth is seems to be spinning, how much those stars seem to be moving. To work out which direction you are facing, there are some apps that are very, very helpful. I use PhotoPills to work out which direction I am pointing my camera. However, as a real basic guide, if you refer to those cheat sheets underneath the, the, the shutter speeds, you will see that the 30 degrees is like a little bit more highlighted. That is where the galactic core is. If all you do is have a free app that will tell you where the galactic core is, it's at negative 30 degrees, or just it says 30 degrees in the cheat sheet, that is the recommended shutter speed to capture the galactic core, which is probably the main photographic subject for when doing Milky Way astronomical photography. Fourth and finally is your pixel tolerance. My maths is based off a six to seven pixel tolerance. I don't know if you've ever zoomed into a pixel here, but it's really, really fine tooth comb stuff we're looking at. And so we're basing this off, you start moving up to six to seven pixels throughout your exposure time. If you would like more or less pixel tolerance, the general guide is to add or remove two seconds from those shutter speeds, those exposure times. Every two seconds will add or remove two pixels of tolerance. Longer shutter speeds will actually give you less noise as well. So remember this pixel tolerance and the shutter speed in general when we talk about signal to noise ratio and ISO later on in the video. And the beauty of my cheat sheets, instead of you trying to work out all of that when you're out in the field, those cheat sheets just have those recommended shutter speeds depending on which direction you're facing. And like I said, as a general guide, the galactic core is at that 30 degree mark. Okay, so moving on to aperture. So aperture is not just a case of having your lens as bright as it possibly can go. See, just about all lenses have some very small flaws when it comes to shooting astronomical photography. And the, normally the brighter you have your lens, there's more those aberrational flaws. They're like little stretching and circles around your stars are enhanced. Now in my previous astro video, I'll leave a link for that up here. I went over a little bit of detail about how I worked out those aberrational percentages for every single lens. If you haven't seen that video yet, do check that out. But what I didn't reveal in that video is the exact aberration percentages for every single lens as you change each aperture and if it's got a zoom the zoom amount so here they are on the screen but don't worry this is I know quite a lot to take in once again if you refer to those cheat sheets for each individual lens it will have those aberrational percentages down depending on what you zoom to or what you set your aper ap <laughs> set your aperture to so once again very simple aberrations versus aperture there's a bit of a balance to have here so how much light you let in through your aperture versus how bad you want your aberrations to be is a personal choice. But as a general guide, anything less than 0.3% is considered perfect. Around 0.6% is still good enough. And anything over 1% is considered really, really bad. Now ISO isn't quite as simple as you'd think. To get a better understanding of this, I'd recommend doing a little bit of research on signal to noise ratio. But to really simplify it, think of it like this. 3200 ISO is much noisier at one tenth of a second versus 10 seconds versus 20 seconds. Same goes for aperture. 3200 ISO, more noise at f4 versus f2.8 versus f1.4. 
So when you're out say shooting sport or wildlife photography, those faster shutter speeds will have far more effect on your noise than with astrophotography with those lower, longer shutter speeds. See, to work out the best ISO, I couldn't just take a bunch of shots without changing the shadow and aperture and just changing the ISO, as this would give me different exposed shots. Some would be too bright, some would be too dark, and if I balance those in editing, then the editing change would generate more noise on its own, not comparable. So to test ISO, I set my camera up with a fixed shutter speed of 20 seconds and a fixed aperture, and then in one third of a stop increments, I increase my ISO from 1,600 all the way up to 6,400, and every time I increase my ISO by one third of a stop, I had to change the light in my room by the exact same amount of light, that one third of a stop. What this resulted in is me having a bunch of different shots from 1,600 ISO to 6,400 ISO, which I could all compare exact side by side, with the only difference being the change in light and the change in ISO. Signal to noise ratio would be exactly the same as my shutter and aperture haven't changed but it let me see complete raw unedited images of how much of effect different ISOs with signal to noise ratio considered has on my astronomical photos. Now I know that might have been a lot for some of you to take in but that's okay we're really going to simplify it. Now what I'm showing you here is that comparison and what I have intentionally left out is any text or information for now for a very important reason your personal taste. Now I'm sure YouTube compression will kill some of this comparison, but if you're not already, please watch this video in the highest quality possible. But what I'd like you to do is decide where along this very exciting grey void of a picture you think you'd be happy with the noise level of a photo. This is zoomed in a ton, so we're getting very hyper picky here. And if you like, here are some numbers to help give you an indication. And remember, this is before any editing or noise reduction. The reason I'm showing it to you in this way is because how much noise is too much noise is a personal taste. And if you aren't sure, if uploading this to YouTube has killed the comparison, and if you're just interested to know my personal taste in this, ISO 1600 is great. I can't see much of a difference between 2000 and 2500 ISO, and both of these are a little bit worse. 3200 ISO is acceptable. ISO 4000 and 5000 is getting noisier than I'd personally like to have to deal with, and 6400 ISO is getting very noticeably bad. So now that we know all the best settings to suit our personal tastes, how do we combine them all together? So once we've dialed in our shutter speed to avoid star trails, when we've found that perfect balance between how bright we want our aperture to be versus how bad we can handle the aberrations being, and once we've cranked up our ISO to give us the perfect signal to noise ratio, maybe you end up with a photo that's just a bit too bright or a bit too dark. Maybe you don't know what a good, perfectly exposed astronomical photo is meant to look like on the back of your camera. Well, I can simplify it like this. If you're not sure, practice. On a nice, cold, clear night, very close to a new moon, grab your favourite astronomical lens and my cheat sheets and head to a nice, dark part of the world with a list of different settings to try. Learn how to find where the galactic core is. I use an app like Photopills. And when capturing these photos, if you're worried about them being a little bit too dark or a little bit too bright, err on the side of a little bit too dark for one very important reason. Fujifilm RAW files are far better at recovering shadows and far better at recovering blacks than they are at recovering highlights and whites. If you want far less noise, if you want far more colour in your stars and your Milky Way photography, err on the side of a little bit too dark rather than a little bit too bright. Now I've received heaps of messages from you guys asking how I edit my astro photos and I promise you that video is coming. I still just need a little bit more time to practice and really refine what I'd like to do. If you have any questions about this video, please feel free to ask down below and don't forget to head over to my Instagram page or my website and download screenshots, share whatever you need to do of my cheat sheets to help follow along with this guy and really translate all this information for when you're out in the field. As always guys, if you could subscribe, it would mean the world to me. We'll have more videos like this coming in the future, but otherwise until next time, I'll catch you next time.